when you talk about Cleveland mayors to a popular audience. Now, Baker's name doesn't come up very often. They know Tom Johnson because of statues on Public Square. They remember Dennis Kucinich because of his recent uh, mayorality. They certainly know about Carl Stokes, the first black mayor of a major American city. Some people will remember Frank Lauschi as the first ethnic mayor of the city of Cleveland. Uh, Baker's not there in many people's minds, and that's a real shame. Very few people know Baker. You say Baker hot settler, they'll, they'll know something. So it's a fascinating reality that a guy who reached the heights that he did nationally, and in, in some cases even internationally, is so lost in um, Cleveland history. He starts out, he was a small guy just over five feet tall, 125 pounds. Uh, the editor of The Plain Dealer, when he interviewed him, talks about how he would sit down and in his chair, he would sort of tuck his um, leg underneath one of his, his other legs and he would sort of sit there, but got very animated as he's talking to him. So this sort of animation, this character comes through when he starts to speak. Many people referred to him as the town bookworm. I mean, the guy ate up books as a, as a boy and as a young adult uh, and saw himself as a person who needed to become fluent in all things classical. He literally read Greek and Latin in their original uh, for fun. <laughs> uh, Newton Baker was born in Martinsburg, West Virginia in 1871. Uh, he came from a family that had been established there for quite a long time. From an early age, uh, his father uh, believed strongly that he should have the best possible education. And his father had become aware of the fact that Johns Hopkins University had been founded in Baltimore. And uh, he wanted him to go to school there. His dad wants him to go to Johns Hopkins, uh, which is this new university. And it's there that really Newton Baker is set off on his course because he befriends the, what would, who would become the uh, president, eventually Woodrow Wilson, a professor. He's having lunches and dinners with them and breakfasts with Woodrow Wilson. The conversations are inspiring to the point where Woodrow Wilson remembers him. So that when Woodrow Wilson makes it into the White House, he remembers Newton Baker. So, Newton Baker makes it even into Washington, which is amazing, but he's got this very interesting history. Baker comes to Cleveland, he's a, he's a rather young man when he comes to Cleveland. Uh, he's a young man on the upswing, if you will, and he's, he's rather idealistic, and he's, he's fairly much, we can tell at this time, imbued in some of the, the principles of the, the progressive movement. I think my feeling about Newton D. Baker and Frederick C. Howe and George Bellamy and other young progressives who came to Cleveland in the 1890s was they really wanted to make the world better. I don't think they saw what was happening as a threat, but they saw it as a problem that could be fixed if it were approached in a rational, humanistic way. And Cleveland is, is sort of trying to find its way as to become a modern city. It is, uh, it's, it's been conflicted by its growth. Its growth has been rapid, it's been haphazard, it's been problematic. There are issues of poverty, overcrowding, and so forth in the city. And, and Cleveland, like other urban areas in, in, in the United States, is, is, is looking for a solution in the progressive movement, which, which has really been bubbling up in the 1890s, is something that, that he becomes associated with. So the really important story, I think, that launches Newton Baker into what would become uh, prominent is when uh, Martin Foran is, uh, was uh, very active in Democrat, local Democratic politics. And so when Martin Foran falls ill and he's supposed to speak at a local uh, Democratic uh, ward meeting, uh, he sends Newton Baker. He's already impressed with Newton Baker and he says, boy, you can do this. Now, Newton Baker is young and Newton Baker shows up and when it comes to Martin Foran's turn to speak, he says, I've been sent in his place. And so the Democratic chairperson says, okay, boy, tell us what you know. And this is a perfect example of what Newton Baker did when he was speaking. You have Newton Baker speaking and all sorts of people talking. They start to pay attention. Contemporary accounts say within a few minutes, people start to whisper and then they start, they stop talking and they listen. And Newton Baker's career was launched. They were so impressed that he knew the Democratic scene, the Democratic Party, the issues, that it really impresses many people. As a partner with Martin Foran, um, he starts to make a name for himself. And with Tom L. Johnson, he hears about him. Um, Tom L. Johnson, a prominent Democrat, 
and of course the mayor of Cleveland. And he is invited to become an assistant law director and quickly becomes law director for the city. He got involved with Johnson because he had done a lot of legal work for Darius people. He'd become a, an ally of Johnson's in Johnson's war with the streetcar companies. He also, later on, had become an architect of the city's, I would say war, maybe that's too strong a term, with the public, with, elect with the electric utility companies particularly. For Tom L. Johnson, as he writes in his autobiography, like on his deathbed, uh, Tom L. Johnson writes that everybody knew right away that the guy to go to would be Newton Baker. It was Newton Baker who becomes a point person in his administration so that as Tom L. Johnson is pushing the three cent fare, as he's pushing municipal ownership, he sends Newton Baker to be his point man. We, we in Cleveland tend to look upon Johnson's years as, as sort of the halcyon days of Cleveland. And essentially what Johnson is doing is, is several things. One, one, he is trying to reinvigor a democracy in Cleveland. He, he goes out and he gives tent meetings when he's campaigning for mayor. He gives tent meetings to advocate for issues such as the three cent streetcar fare. So he's trying to get the public, the civic body of Cleveland engaged, which is not an easy thing to do in the early 1900s because one is looking at, at a very polyglot city. And, and Johnson's tent meetings go all over the city. He had this circus style. He was flamboyant. He had a, he had a, a roadster, a, a wind and car called the Red Devil that he drove around it. But the substance in Johnson is he, he was a manager. He, he built his, his, his fortune on managing streetcar systems well and on inventing things. He was also an inventor. And he felt, like many progressives did, that the best way to run a city was not through politics, but through management, through scientific management. And what Johnson would end up doing is when he staffed his departments in the city, he looked not for political hacks or people who had voted for him, but people who either had the sympathy or the smarts to clean up the water system, to reform the penal system, to straighten out the police department, to work with the park system. So there's, there's expertise in the city for the first time, and it's, it's Johnson that brings that in. It's a managerial system that ultimately will result in the 1920s in a brief experiment in city manager politics in Cleveland. So you, you see that there. So what Johnson begins advocating is something called home rule the right of municipalities to form governments that, that, by charter, that meet their needs. They create it, not the state house. And, and so he advocates this, but it doesn't occur under his regime, if you will, under his mayorality. It occurs one mayorality later, after Herman Baer takes a mayor, mayorality for two years, when Johnson's protege, Newton D. Baker, comes in. And so in 1912, the peak of the progressive period, uh, this, this is when the Constitutional Convention finally gets together and, and they pass a variety of amendments to the Constitution, one of which allows for home rule. Uh, and one of the key figures in, in getting that, those amendments passed is Newton D. Baker of Cleveland. Tom Johnson advocates, as a matter of fact, he destroys his mayoral career on advocating a three cent streetcar fare. This is a, a, a long fight to municipalize utility services, transit, electricity, uh, even water. But what he's, he's, he's trying to do with this three cent fare issue is, is to make public transit affordable for the mass of people in Cleveland. And, and, and a nickel versus three cents, if it's a nickel fare, What's the difference with three cents? Well, back in the early 1900s, if you're a mill worker and you need to get to work and, and you're making a maximum of $400 a year and you're trying to support a wife and a child, cutting your transportation costs by literally 40% is a major issue. So that's what the three cent fare is. It is a 40% cost in transportation uh, travel, uh, cost reduction in transportation travel for the people of Cleveland. In many respects, what you saw in Ohio was the rise of the public utility or so-called public service corporations. They were the first, we had already had the railroads on a federal basis become the first big complex American business organizations because the, of, the, of the amount of investment in gas companies, electric companies, streetcar companies, and because they were natural monopolies and that you really wouldn't have two gas companies in the same time. Two, to electric companies. Baker believed, in fact, that actually it was the rise of a so-called public service or public utility company that really led to the um, 
corruption or the possible corruption of legislatures. Tom L. Johnson knows and sees the brilliance of Baker right up front. So he is, it's Newton Baker who is receiving the attorneys, who is getting the, uh, who is, who is getting the complaints essentially. They're showing up at City Hall and they are challenging Tom L. Johnson's ideas and it's Newton Baker who's turning them away or it's Newton Baker who is coming up with the legal justification for this. And so I think 55 injunctions, it was constant. The legal battles over eight, nine years that uh, Newton Baker is fighting on behalf of Tom L. Johnson, on behalf of these ideas of progressivism. Uh, it's Newton Baker and I, I in, 50, in six months he dispatches with 15 injunctions. He's going back and forth to Columbus. He is the point person who eventually is so effective that the companies give way after this these multiple year battle and it allows for what would become the three cent fare and the municipal ownership. So Newton Baker is unbelievable in his ability to handle uh, all of these injunctions. So it's pretty interesting how Newton Baker um, does so successfully, so successfully that when the city of Cleveland turns out Tom L. Johnson, when Tom L. Johnson loses his mayoral race to Herman Bear, who you know a few people know about, it's Newton Baker who actually still maintains his position as a law director, and then Newton Baker follows up the Bear administration, and he becomes elected mayor. So Newton Baker was incredibly well respected and incredibly successful in his administration, especially in the early years. Baker is mayor of Cleveland. It's, it's 1912. Uh, he has new constitutional amendment that, that allows home rule to, to uh, come into force. So he now has the power as mayor to select the people who will be on the commission to draft the home rule bill. He has the power to, uh, as mayor, he has that, the, to push the, the, the new charter and the new charter is passed in 1913 and, and voila, it's a different Cleveland. It's the Cleveland that the late Tom L. Johnson would love to have seen. And so it's really that idea of local home rule that spurs Newton Baker's idea of civitism. And for him, civitism is this idea of a love of place. It is a love of community, just like it would be patriotism on a national level. It's love of a country that would spur you to join the military if you needed to, if, if uh, need be, or to um, believe in the ideals of governance and of democracy and of being a good citizen, a model citizen. So it's Baker's idea of civitism on a local level. If you can inspire civitism, all sorts of things would flow from that. You could have excellent urban planning and development. We're talking about creating what Tom L. Johnson did and the group plan, right? Creating a city center that was really a monument to civitism, a love of Cleveland, a love of place that would then create all these other institutions. So you have the City Club and you have the Cleveland Foundation and all these organizations that eventually are founded in many ways out of De Newton Baker's idea of civitism. He also continues the Johnsonian three cent legacy. He does get three cent streetcar fares, but then he does incredible things like has city trawlers catching fish in the lake and they sell three cent fish. Clarence Kramer writes in his biography of Baker that, that they also they also had three cent dance halls. They're the municipal dance halls. Why municipal dance halls? Well, it allowed for dancing, which could be considered immoral in other places, to, to be governed by strict moral codes under the city's uh, oversight. So three cent dances. And then supposedly, I don't know how this works, three cent light because what, what Baker has done is one of Johnson's dreams was a municipal electric plant. And uh, Cleveland Public Power today is, is it, it's born as uh, municipal power in 1914, thanks to Newton T. Baker. Uh, the thing that strikes me in looking back on some of his record was that he was considered to be probably the father of Muni Light. Now we know the conditions for Muni Light were set up earlier by the fights between Tom L. Johnson and the electric utilities and the traction companies, but it was under Baker's watch that the city really perfected the municipal light concept and got it going and managed to provide cheap electrical power to people compared to the rates charged by the illuminating company, which was then one of Baker's great political and corporate enemies. Well, Newt, Newt D. Baker's philosophy as, as a mayor, as, as a lawyer, as a politician, and, and I think in, in, in a way as a well-educated man was, was that, that education was the, the key to creating a functional society.
a lot of what was going on at the tent meetings at, uh, by Johnson and Baker was education of a sort. These, these were classes in the community about what was going on. But Baker's interest in adult education uh, was such that, that he created what became, he was a key for a person in advocating the creation of what became Cleveland College of Western Reserve University, which was an after-hours adult education program housed in downtown Cleveland. And, and what Baker was essentially doing here was taking the tent meeting, my opinion, taking the tent meeting, institutionalizing it, and formalizing it under the tutelage and governance of the major university in the city. And, and I think in this day and age, Cleveland College has ceased to exist, but in this day and age, when we think about adult education, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. Gee, there's Cuyahoga Community College, there are all these you know, after-school classes offered by Baldwin Wallace and so forth. Uh, there's Cleveland State University, very community-oriented. But if you're looking at its beginning here in Cleveland, it is, it is, it's Cleveland College, and, and it's Newton D. Baker advocating for that. And so this was an attempt to give the benefits of collegiate education to men and women who had daytime jobs, who had responsibilities as parents, who had other things they had to do, as a way of elevating the level of public information available in the community to make decisions. For many, many, many years, it was probably the most lasting visible thing, I'd argue, that he devoted so much time to, uh, and so much, I think, philanthropy to, uh, as part of his work with Western Reserve University, because he believed that without a well-educated citizenry, you could not have a well-operated government. The City Club was another example of the same phenomenon, of which issues would get ventilated for discussion, and that would help people have some kind of um, basis on which to reach a consensus, one hoped anyway. And so he also did such things as support the arts, which was considered to be kind of almost strange in that era. And the city had orchestras, and, or, and orchestras, support like a band, and they had a publicly financed or funded dances and dance halls. And uh, he was a person that liked to have meetings with people and uh, kind of talk over civic problems and so forth under a tent. Uh, something he'd learned from Tom L. Johnson's tent campaigns when Johnson was mayor and also running. If you think back of it through the long lens of history a hundred years later, in this short period of time, you have the, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Cleveland Clinic, the Museum of Art, the Cleveland Foundation, the West Side Market, they all came into being. And it's tough to imagine that happening absent the efforts of Tom L. Johnson and Newton D. Baker. Woodrow Wilson asks, Newton Baker in 1912 to get on his staff, I think as Department of uh, Secretary of the Interior, and Newton Baker turns him down. Newton Baker has civitism. He wants to stay in Cleveland, um, and he wants to stay committed to the city of Cleveland and good governance, and so he turns down the president for a spot in his cabinet, but by 1916, it, Woodrow Wilson asks for him again. Wilson called on his old friend and former pupil. Newton Baker to become Secretary of War. There was no Defense Department, there was no separate Air Force or anything else. The War Secretary and the Navy Secretaries basically ran what we now call the Pentagon. And so Baker, who had been again essentially a pacifist, became the great kind of organizer, manager of probably the most broadly based military undertaking the United States ever took since the Civil War. So Baker comes in and within months of becoming Secretary of War, he is equipping the United States to participate in World War I. It's interesting because when he's chosen as Secretary of War, he tells the, you know, the press who are interviewing him, he says, I'm an innocent. He said, I, I don't know anything about this I'll have to learn about. I forget how he phrases it. So he admits that he's, he's, he's not a military man. The United States, which has a small standing army, needs to create an army to combat the Germans and the Austrians. And, and they project a two million man army. It's Baker's job as Secretary of War to put that army together, to get it equipped, to get it across the ocean to fight. The fact that he does this is, is, is unbelievable. It, it, is, it is an organizational duty uh, that, that boggles the mind. In terms of, of, of organizing the efforts for the national efforts for World War I, or at the Great War, they would have called it. He does an amazing job. Um, and he does an amazing job because he brings a lot of his Cleveland contemporaries, some who struggle, but 
he realizes actually, sort of against his instincts, that centralization for a war effort is needed, even though he sort of is against centralization, right? He fights for home rule and he's for local governance. So he, he comes around to understanding the importance of that and, and eventually succeeding. And Baker was still an idealist, and, and one of the things that, that was close to him, and it was close to his friend and quasi-mentor Woodrow Wilson, was that this was to be the last war. And that after this war there would be a League of Nations and the United States would join the League of Nations. The League of Nations is analogous to our United Nations now, something that the United States joined after World War II. Uh, this was Wilson's dream and, and, and it was Baker's dream as well. Most people in America really had, in many ways, had shunned this idea of internationalism. But he, like Woodrow Wilson, had been an internationalist. He believes in the League of Nations. And in 1924, he turns a lot of Democrats to become internationalists, to support the League of Nations. 1924 is a Democratic convention. Baker could possibly have been a candidate at that time, but, but he's asked to give a speech, and there's a 20-minute time limit on the speech. You know, some of us have a tough time sticking to 20 minutes. And, and his speech is about why the United States needs to join the League of Nations. And, and it's a speech that, that brought the audience to tears. And, and Baker recounts that, that, that he closed the eyes of wounded soldiers who were about to die that he spoke with them and he said the soldiers essentially ma mainly said two things that they, they wanted their, their families to know that they had done their best they had done their duty but they also wanted their mother to know that there would never be another war that war would be over and so Baker uses this and, and when his 20 minutes are over the audience asks him to speak for more and so he talks for another hour the question of this hour, therefore, is not whether a classically phrased and inerrant document has been drawn, but whether the fairest hope of men shall be realized. If we have but the goodness and the faith necessary to make any League of Nations work, we can make this one work. And, and the reports are literally after this, they're, they're, they're applauding madly, they're in tears. The irony of this is that he's talked about the need to join the League of Nations, and the plank in the Democratic platform about the League of Nations, and joining the League of Nations is voted down later by the same convention by a two to one margin. When Baker uh, came back from Washington, he resumed the practice of law very successfully. He became one of the founders of what became Baker, and was now still Baker and Hostetler. He had a very, very, very broad array of primarily corporate clients. His clients ranged again from the corporate moguls, the seal barons, the Van Swearingen's, RCA, other companies. At the same time, though, he also was working very steadily to advance the causes of the free press and also to ensure fair trial proceedings uh, for people in terms of the courts and how they operated in the state. Incidentally, one of the things I think is remarkable about him, especially given the times in which he lived, although I'm no question this about his honor, he was a person that strongly and publicly fought discrimination based on religion. He was a person that uh, fought anti-Semitism. He fought anti-Catholicism. He was a head uh, of the National Conference of Christians and Jews, which then is now is a very important organization for interfaith understanding and tolerance. In 1932, there was a candidate uh, who, if he had been put forward, may have had a chance to, to have gotten the nomination, and that, that, that was Newton D. Baker. He was a viable candidate for uh, the Democratic nomination for the presidency. But instead, Baker becomes an advocate for the Roosevelt program. But I think this is one of these things. When's the last time that a Cleveland mayor has been considered, and this is truly considered, uh, for the nomination of the mayor party, a major party's uh, presidential candidacy? The question arises, why should we care about Newton Deal Baker? What does he stand for? What's the significance if I'm Joe or Jones so-and-so in Greater Cleveland today? He really created a civically engaged society in, in Cleveland. Uh, he truly was an idealist. He changed the way the city run, ran. They came here and saw this as a place of opportunity and also in many respects as a laboratory for their ideas about how people should live together politically. They were Jeffersonians, they believed in local government being closer to the people, and smaller local government being accessible to the people. They believed in essentially a system of equity and fairness. His depth of knowledge 
and his clear-headed uh, thinking, his ability to think on his feet. It attempts to improve constantly our school systems and embellish our higher education systems and our cultural institutions like the museum and the, the orchestra and the settlement houses. And City Hall and the courthouse in this wonderful design overlooking Lake Erie with all this open space. Donald Johnson fully admitted that the guy who helped to keep afloat his administration, the guy who helped to push forward uh, the same ideals of Tom L. Johnson and of progressivism was Newton Baker. If you think back of the, th of the things that those two men accomplished, it's kind of breathtaking. <laughs>